Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Hello, Geekon conference. I hope you had a great party yesterday in the evening, and I hope you're not too hungover from yesterday, from the parties. Um, but no worries. Uh, I won't bother you with hardcore, low-level technical stuff today. Uh, today, uh, in this session, we will mostly talk about some software architecture kind of things. And um, the t title uh, is Reducing Chattiness, Communication Strategies for Microservices. And as a starter, um, I would like to ask you a question. Now, what do you think? Which of those structures looks better and cleaner to you from the outside? Who's for the one on the left-hand side for this one? Yeah, quite a few folks. Who prefers the one on the right-hand side? Yeah, also cleaner, okay. Let's start off with this one. So that's something that we usually start off with. So uh, a lot of us start from monolithic applications. Now, another question, who is dealing with monoliths or monolithic applications right now and wants to go for microservices in the future? Yeah, quite a few, quite a few. Who are doing greenfield microservice projects? Yeah, well, here and there, a couple. Um, the thing is, um, when this is a sentence that I hear quite often, microservices uh, or monoliths suck, Let's start with microservices, and there's this REST kind of thing. So that's something that I see quite often happening uh, in uh, applications like that. And what I often see is like this REST and microservice kind of thing um, is very popular, and it's for many organizations that I usually work with, um, sort of something like a, a default choice here. And um, the thing is, the monolith from the outside doesn't look quite ugly if you look at it from the outside. But of course, if we tear down that wall over there on that side, we will probably see quite a mess in many organizations. I don't want to say that every monolith is crap, but I w what I often see is that um, monoliths tend to grow um, historically. Um, that's what we say in Germany very often, um, sometimes also hysterically uh, to a certain degree. When you go to microservices, a lot of that complexity, complexity is implicitly hidden behind the monolith. When we go to, to microservices, we expose a lot of that complexity, a lot of those dependencies between certain modules, certain business components and stuff like that, we make them explicitly visible to the outside world. And the challenges for this kind of communication grows exponentially because suddenly you remember from the starter slide uh, that um, each of those arrows, uh, arrows could obviously be a remote call over a network. And so this is something we, we, should, be ta we should take care of. So this is one of my favorite tweets on Twitter by my dear friend Jochen. Um, he once wrote, a good developer is like a werewolf, afraid of silver bullets. There is no silver bullet out there, none. So you could be in a situation where a restful communication would be perfect for you. You could be in a situation where uh, event-driven microservices architecture could be a suitable solution. But you could also be in a situation where microservices wouldn't be the right solution for your, your thing. So that uh, I would say, well done monolith would be way better for you. So please, I can't stress that one uh, enough. Basically, distributed systems are tough and distributed systems are hard. If you don't need a distributed sy system, you are in a very comfortable position and I congratulate you. You basically actually don't want a distributed system just for the sake of a distributed system. And um, 
when we talk about integration, a lot of us, especially us software developers, software architects, we love technologies, yeah. We, we, we like to get our hands dirty on the fancy, shiny, new stuff all the time. And uh, we want to play with technologies, but I'm really sorry. Integration is not just technical. One aspect you need to take care of are teams. How teams communicate with each other. How they influence each other. So basically, eventually, do you have a team that is taking an influence on the interface design or the model design of another team because they, hey, can we have four more fields on that model you sent to us over the interface? The next aspect is coupling. What we want to do, or one of the major drivers for microservices, for adopting microservices, is we want to achieve loose coupling between those things. Now, if we ramp up a microservice architecture that is tightly coupled, we will sooner or later have a distributed monolith. We don't want that, I think. The next thing, our quality criteria. This may come as a little bit of a surprise to you. What do you really need in terms of scalability, consist, uh, consistency, and so on? Your business folks will always tell you, everything needs to be consistent right away. ACID transactions. They love ACID transactions, like big transaction boundaries and stuff like that. Question that. And finally, we arrive in our home turf, the technologies. But let's first off start and look at uh, the team factor here. Um, a very nice helper here is the complete area of domain-driven design. I won't do a domain-driven design talk now. We could talk a about that alone for three days. Easy going. We could do a three-day domain-driven design conference with four tracks. I want to tease you a couple of things especially in terms of the team communication and the decoupling part. Decoupling can be done on one side on a technical level, but you should also take a very close look how you decouple on a business model level. Because if you don't decouple your business model, it doesn't matter what kind of technology you adopt later on. You can use the fancy new toys and the fancy stuff as much as you want. When your business model is tightly coupled to each other, you're screwed. So. One thing that helps you really well with that is the idea of a bounded context. Um, and many folks from the microservices community will obviously can be quoted with a sentence, cut your microservices along business capabilities, aka bounded context. And one of the most important things, the bounded context is the boundary around the meaning of a given business model. Let me give you a quick example on that. Um, Let's take a look at you in the front row at Geekon. So obviously, you came there. There is no similarity. Uh, <laughs> and um, the, the folks at Geekon, the fine folks that put on this great conference, they, ramp, they have a bounded context with reservations. So they would model this visitor, I would say quite CRM-like, whatever. But you know you get a catering as well. And there is some capacity planning going on. Uh, who is speaking at which time uh, on the conference? How many vegetarians do we have? How many meat eaters do we have? How many vegans do we have? Now, in a service-oriented architecture world, we would say, oh, that's a part of the customer. Let's model that onto the customer as well. And the customer grows, 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 grows. Gets bigger and bigger. No, the perfect thing is numbers in this context. So the perfect model for a customer in the uh, event management or uh, context is basically a number. 10 vegetarians, 50 meat eaters, and so on and so forth. And then we also have those badges. Yeah? Those things here. There we have a name on them, a job description, and eventually a Twitter handle. Um, do we need to couple that directly to the uh, to the uh, reservation context? Obviously not. You can decouple it with an organizational solution. Let's say, out of this thing over there, the uh, reservation context, it dumps out an Excel file, and this is just Word templates, for instance. 
you could go for an organizational solution if you want to. Now, those boundary contexts are one thing, but they interact with each other, and this is where a context map comes into play. Um, the context map takes a look how microservices interact to each other and how the teams communicate there. And the general idea is the first thing that we look at when we talk about integration is call flows. So I am calling this web service over there. So let's say you're a web service. I'm calling you. Hey, do something. And that's the call flow. So let's say we have a scoring engine. And this is uh, directly communicating to a credit agency in order to get a credit rating for a potential customer. But there is another kind of flow, the flow of the model, the model flow. So basically, this credit agency up there, it has a model. It has its own rating model. It can be a point-based rating model. It can be a textual rating model. It can be a model of an international rating standard, let's say AAA, B minus, whatever. And they sent this one down to scoring. So the model flows from an upstream system to a downstream system. You have to take a look at it like a river. I'm coming from Nuremberg in Germany, and there's the Pignitz going, that's a river, through Nuremberg. Our neighbor city, Fürth, um, is downstream of the Pignitz. So the Pignitz flows from Nuremberg to Fürth. And this is how we take a look at the model flow, and that's also the focus of the context map. I'm not going into too much detail on those patterns. Just a quick overview for you. And I really recommend you to read a little bit further in that. I have only 50 minutes time, and we could talk two hours alone about that. Uh, but think about those things. So for instance, on the upstream system, I have an open host service. That's basically, for instance, a RESTful resource, a web service, some, something that's publishing some events to a message broker or something like that. Um, I'll go to the downstream, the consuming system. They can influence the model of the upstream system. So they can go ahead and say, hey, that's nice that you want to change your interface. But I'm out of budget. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the staffing to cater that. Please don't do that. And I will escalate it to the management, and I have a veto right. On the other side, the conformist is one where I say, oh, I totally conform to your model. I totally stick to your model. I pull it into my microservice. So suddenly, for instance, the credit agency's model gets duplicated, and it suddenly lives its own life in the scoring. But every time the credit agency changes something, scoring needs to do that as well. And you can do that on your own will, because you think that the upstream model is really cool, is really awesome. You can be forced to do that by having a company-wide data model or business model. And the last of the downstream patterns is the anti-corruption layer. You take in an external model. Let's say I take in a customer, and I transform it to an address sticker. Because I really don't care about customers in my microservices, I need to produce some address stickers. So I transform it. And please do that on a semantic level. Please don't go ahead and say that a DTO to a business model, and you transform that one to one on a class level, is an anti-corruption layer, because it's no semantic translation. You want to have that translation on a language level, basically. And then we have some things in between. The shared kernel is, I would say, something that systems um, depend on, on a physical level. Let's say a shared jar file between two Java applications, a shared database. That's the monolith classic, the shared kernel. Everybody selects into every table, for instance. Um, the next one is a very interesting thing, published language. Who knows about ISBN numbers on books? Who has ever seen a physical Java library that implements the ISBN number? No one. It's a specification. You go to, to, uh, to Wikipedia, you look for an ISBN number, you find it. And everybody can implement it as much as they want. They can represent it as a string. They can implement the checksums. They can implement the, the book number and whatever. Um, it's a freedom of choice for everyone that runs on this. This is a very valuable pattern 
for decoupled microservice landscapes, for instance. And then finally, we have separate ways. <laughs> well, basically, separate ways says those systems don't have to do anything with, with each other. Is that interesting? No. But what you often have is that you have one system in the call center, and the agent is working with a second system, and they are copy-pasting data from one system to another. The organizational solution, and this is something you want to know about, you want to be aware of. And eventually, sometimes, you really want to do that because it fits your needs. It's good enough. And I think in the IT community, we often forget about the good enough solution. Sorry. So basically, you can also map that to Conway's law. Basically, team communication, share kernel, customer supplier, conformist have a very tight coupling integration on a team level. The others are not so tightly coupled. They go more or less for a team independence. Today, when I was in my taxi driving to the conference, I read a tweet on Twitter that I had to include into this talk. It's this one. Um, yeah? I see that way too often, way too often. Oh, let's do Kafka. Everybody does it. It's the shiny new toy of the microservice geeks out there. But what are your real quality criteria? I'm not talking there about your non-functional requirement sheet that gets copy-pasted from project to project. I'm talking about real quality criteria. Th there is an ISO standard for that, 25010, that gives you a glimpse on what you can think about in terms of quality criteria. And you want to build a solution that fits your quality criteria. How about consistency? The system needs to be scalable, is a quote that I hear very often from business folks when I work with them. So what do you mean in terms of scalability? Do you, need, do you mean online banking scalability, where we approximately know how scalable? what the scale is, or do we need Twitter scalability? Let's imagine um, the White House turns into a donut overnight. What would happen on Twitter? It would explode. The memes would be coming in, you know? It's a totally different kind of scale. So please be aware of that, and take that aspect very seriously when you think about integration. So now we talked about some not so technical things, but I think they are very important that you have an awareness of them when you start to apply technical solutions to the integration thing. And now let's ta talk about technology. Very often, especially in the early days of microservices, you read all the Netflix blogs and so on, and you could get the impression that REST is like the microservices protocol. Is it? Let's start to look at the technological aspect from two sides. Um, in my eyes, one side are technical options that you have. Let's say RESTful resources, messaging, domain events, and eventually feeds. I will come to the feeds later on because I think they are a really attractive option for you folks. But there is another thing uh, in terms of architecture styles. Choreography versus orchestration. Let's take a look at that one first. What does that mean? Orchestration is basically that one microservice actively calls another microservice. So I know that I need to talk to you first, that you do something for me. Then I go to you, you need to do something for me, and then I need to go to you, and you need to do something. So I am orchestrating certain calls. So Obviously, the credit application here knows what to do. It knows about the process. It knows whom to call, and so on. Another option would be that I just say, hey, a new credit application has been submitted. And you're interested in that. You're interested in that. You're interested in that. And you grab that message. I tell you, hey, a new credit application has been submitted. You come to me. hey." What, what about that? Ah, okay, I know what to do. I'll come back to you later. That's choreography. So basically, this kind of thing. Um, now, I think 
it's very important to be aware of that. And I think you should make, I would say, a, a macro architectural choice for your microservice um, landscape. What, what would be your preferred way of working? In microservices, I always recommend that my customers think in macro architecture and micro architecture. Macro architecture is are decisions that are, I would say, the law for all microservices in your landscape. Microservices is not about everyone does what they want because you will end up with total chaos and a absolute technology and integration zoo. No one wants that. Um, it's let's make a couple of defaults. Our one of our default choices is we go for orchestration or choreography as a first choice for our integration. Another macro architecture choice is how about the logging format or the monitoring format? So let's say every microservice should publish their metrics in a format that let's say uh, Prometheus can easily digest for instance or consume for instance. That's macro architecture. Micro architecture is the freedom for the teams. Hey, in the inside the macro architecture you have a couple of freedoms. And there should be a big room for freedom and a decently chosen amount of macro architectural rules. This is one of them in my eyes. Now, when we, after we've understood that, let's take a look how the technical options come into play here. Let's start off with our RESTful resources first. Basically, I think REST is widely and very widely well understood nowadays. Um, I would say most teams know it, most teams implement it, but not so many teams implement it really well. Especially when we come down to stuff like hypermedia, different multiple representations, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically, RESTful communication is synchronous by default. So I am calling a REST resource, and I'm usually waiting for it to answer. So I'm waiting for a response here, synchronous communication. Now, I would say implementing a call to a RESTful resource is nowadays super easy. You can work with declarative REST clients like Fine, you can use the uh, REST template from the Spring stack, and so on and so forth. But implementing a robust one that works in a microservice environment is a totally different kind of thing because you need to be aware of some pitfalls in distributed systems because usually your customers are waiting for you to perform the request. So there's somebody eagerly waiting for their scoring result after a credit application. Now, the things that you should, um, I would say, take into account when you think about that are, first of all, service discovery. In a microservice environment, servers come and go. Your AWS compute resources come and go. So there is an EC2 instance that has a problem. Oh, let's throw it away, create a new one. Um, you deploy multiple, you do multiple deployments of Docker containers in Kubernetes or whatever, and so on. So obviously, hard coding service endpoints doesn't work here. Uh, it's a really tough thing. So you need to be aware of service discovery. The next challenge is resilience. How do you handle errors, latencies, downtimes, fallback solutions? Uh, and so on. You want to have a graceful degradation of service in such an environment. You don't want one microservice dragging down your whole application landscape here. And finally, you want to perform some kind of load balancing. Now, let's first start off th with the service discovery uh, thing. In my eyes, you have three options for service discovery. Y the first thing is you want to look up a service by name. You don't want to say, ah, that service is under the IP address, whatever. You say, hey, I want to talk to the scoring service. That's the one I want to talk to. I, I, I don't care where it is. Just give me the scoring service here. And one thing that you can do, you can work with dedicated service registries. There are many products out there. I would say the most popular ones out there are currently 
Eureka or console, but please be aware, this is a piece of your central infrastructure. If your service registry goes down for a longer amount of time, you're, into, you're in trouble globally. You don't want that one to go down, so you should set it up in a redundant way and you want to have a dedicated caching on the service references on the client side and so on and so forth. It needs to be maintained. It's another piece of infrastructure that you have to handle. The next way to do that is platform-based. So if you're working with a PaaS um, cloud platform, let's say on-premise or on the public, uh, on public cloud offerings, most of those platforms offer you, I would say, some sort of a lightweight service discovery. So for instance, in Cloud Foundry, you have roots to an application, and behind a root can be X instances of a given microservice. You can do the same uh, with Kubernetes and so on and so forth. So some platforms they will deliver you something like that. Or you can go the old school way with DNS. So service discovery with DNS lookups, you need to maintain the DNS stuff and so on. That's the one thing. That's the service reference. What you also want to do in a microservice environment for ultimate decoupling, you want to leverage hypermedia. So there is a, an idea, hypermedia as the engine of application state. Oh, I, I remember that. I always keep on forgetting that. Uh, and um, it's for interface discovery. So you just go to a service and tell us, hey, what can I do with you? And it, it tells it. Uh, so there are co a couple of, I would say, substandards around Hato's like HAL or Siren or whatever decide on one, on a global level. You don't want one Merkle service to work with Siren and the other one to work with HAL representations on that. Please decide on a standard. The next thing is resilience. In terms of resilience, let's start with a potential problem. So that's, I would say, a usual thing that many, many Java applications, especially in a monolithic world, took, a, uh, took their approach on integration. So uh, I start sending requests to an email service, but this email service starts getting performance problems. It gets slower and slower and slower. And there is one global thread pool in your application server or in your runtime, and it keeps filling up. So suddenly, the thread pool is full, and we can't do any other requests to other resources anymore. And so up there, on the upper side, Requests start piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up, piling up, and the system is dead. We don't want that. The solution for that um, are a couple of patterns in the resilience world. Um, we could do a whole conference day just on resilience, just a quick teaser for you folks here. Um, the first pattern are bulkheads, so that you create a dedicated thread pool for each endpoint, for each, each service you're consuming. That's called a bulkhead. So when the, um, let's say, the uh, email service thread pool is full, we can still talk to the role service here. When this thread pool is full, we can still talk to the email service, and we never risk our application to go down just because of one service, because we isolate those things. This is taken from the shipbuilding industry. Basically, when you take a, a look at a big ship at the sea, you have bulkheads underneath. When one of them runs full of water, when it's leaking water into it, the ship doesn't go down. It just fills up one chamber, and the other chambers, they are still not flooded. So the ship doesn't sink immediately. The next thing that you can introduce are circuit breakers. Circuit breakers are from ele electrical engineering. So um, currently, the circuits in this room are open. As we see, we have energy. You can hear me even in the back of the room. There is light, the project is working, everything's good. If suddenly some machine starts to screw up the electricity, the circuit closes. No, it's the other way around. The circuit opens. It's the other way around. Sorry, I screwed it up. Currently, the circuit is closed. If a machine screws it up, it's open. Sorry for that. Now, we can do the same thing. What about the email service having a high latency or just throwing errors, errors, errors? 
we don't send any more requests to it. And in the resilience area, there is even another state is half open. What would usually happen in an application landscape that doesn't have this? A service goes down because of errors, and suddenly it comes back again. And you have a full thread pool waiting just for it to come back again. It's like a knockout punch for the system. Boom. It stands up, and it gets the next chap, boom, and goes down again. You don't want that to happen. So eventually, you want to, to go to the system like, dun, dun, dun. are you good? Are you good? Are you good? Ah, OK, now we ramp up the full load. That's circuit breakers. There are libraries for that. Hystrix is a very popular one. And they implement those patterns for you. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is load balancing. Load balancing is, there, there we have a couple of possibilities. One possibility is client-side load balancing. So that our microservice clients can load balance the requests according to their own needs across different servers. But for that, they need to know about the servers they're working with. A popular um, example for that is, for instance, Ribbon from the Netflix stack. The next one is platform-based load balancing. So if you take a look at Cloud Foundry, you can have 10 instances of an application behind one root. And Cloud Foundry, for instance, does the load balancing for you. So does Kubernetes, for instance. So you can have it in your PaaS platform implemented. So you don't need to do any more client load balancing. But the downside is you stick to one load balancing standard here. Other clients, they can have their own load balancing rules in the other way. Or we could work with dedicated load balancers as infrastructure components. These can be dedicated hardware components, software components, or something. That's a dedicated centralized infrastructure. But this is often not maintained by your dev team. This is classical ops stuff. Uh, so even if you do dev ops, which is obviously a good idea for microservices, you, you, you will have to, to talk to the ops folks for this stuff. I've never seen a dev team maintaining a hardware load balancer, to be honest. Now, when we combine that with the service discovery things, I think uh, a good fit is in terms of client-side load balancing or the service registries. Platform-based, you can combine that with either the service registry approach or the platform-based approach. I would actually likely prefer the platform-to-platform -platform match here. And on the infrastructure, it's in the infrastructure. So to be honest, my preferred way of, of implementing that for microservices would be this way, th this area over there. That's the one I want to be in, actually. Now, those are the challenges regarding RESTful communication. You can do it, but you need to be aware that you need to think about quite a few pitfalls. Please be aware of that. Um, and another thing, REST is usually used for orchestrated microservices. The next option that we can use is messaging. Messaging is really old. It's nothing new. You know, Messaging has been around for decades already. And so you have some microservices. They send messages to topics and queues, the standard usual messaging stuff. And other microservices, they consume of the message broker. And usually, um, they are decoupled by the message broker in the middle. So they don't know each other anymore. So you don't need to deal with service registry. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so all they need to know, ha, huh, there is the service broker as a centralized infrastructure. Um, let's revisit the challenges from the rest part with regards to messaging. In terms of service discovery, all you need to know about is where is the message broker? What's the reference to the message broker? That's all you need. So you don't need to deal with a dedicated service discovery with every system you want to interact with. In terms of resilience, um, you, you obviously um, don't need to handle errors, I would say, right away when a, an, a request is made, because messaging is asynchronous by nature. So the, the usual thing that you need to manage 
in this case is latency. So in the case of errors, usually we see an increase in latency. Or as our users would say, oh, the system is quite slow today. That's usually the thing we see. What we usually or rarely see is that an error propagates directly to a client. And they get a message, oh, sorry, can't do that right now. This can only happen when you can't place messages on the message broker. And you have a problem there, the error would cascade right away. But um, otherwise, um, in terms of resilience, there's less to manage in this case. And in terms of load balancing, it's actually quite easy. You either scale up the message broker when it doesn't perform very well in terms of transporting the messages, or you scale the number of instances of message consumers here. So when I want messages to, work, to be worked off faster, the easiest way to deal with that is increase the number of consumers, of consuming in instances. Um, so that's that. Um, there is a book on that, Enterprise Integration Patterns. And my personal opinion is when you deal with integration, either in a service-oriented architecture world or in a microservice world, do yourself a very, very good favor and read this book. It's basically the Bible on uh, integration. And I mean, yes, it's called enterprise integration patterns, so please don't be bothered about it being too enterprisey. Um, it's written by Gregor Hoppe and Bobby Wolf. And there is also a website on that uh, where you can get a quick glance at it where many of those patterns are being uh, explained. Now, obviously, messaging leads us to choreographed microservice. We publish a message and some are subscribing to it and perform something on that. Now let's take a look at this one. You've seen this element on my slides quite a bit already. The credit application submitted event. If you leverage domain events for uh, your, um, uh, your integration, you come up to event-driven microservices. I would say event-driven microservices are currently a very popular style of dealing with microservices. Basically, domain event is something really similar, simple. It's something that domain experts, domain experts care about. It's business events. And you can put them on a timeline and you have a series of discrete events that you can work with. And they're really simple to, to understand. They're easy to grasp. You can even talk to your business folks, to your domain experts, domain experts about domain events. Hey, what should we do after the credit application has been submitted? Yeah, this and that and that. Credit application submitted event. So that's quite a nice thing. You can put them on a timeline and an event is always something that happened in the past. So a good number of events is a shipment delivered event, customer verified event, card checked out event. Everyone in the room probably knows what happened there. There are uh, semantically correct. They have a semantic, they, they talk to you. Other events would be um, create custom event. An uh, event does nothing. And it also doesn't trigger anything like the will save item event. So basically you want to be in the upper part of the slide with, with your event names. And events can also be triggered in different ways. So the easiest thing is a user action. I submit my credit application. But also, time can be a factor. I send you an offer, and this offer has a grace period of two weeks. After the two weeks, there is a new event, grace period expired event, for instance. Documents, you sent me a contract uh, with your signature back. You say, OK, I agree on the contract. So a document can trigger an event. Also, other applications and other events can trigger events. Now, in terms of the payload, when we want to use them for integration or for communication, we can go ahead and put the full payload into our events. We can work with restful URLs in our events. We can even work with empty events, or we can mix it up. Let's take a closer look. The full payload is like you put in really a lot of information uh, into those events. For instance, here I've put in the whole custom into the event. Super easy for your consumers, but it also invites them to a tighter coupling. 
you literally expose a lot of your internals to your events here. The next thing is you put a REST resource to the event in there. You can combine events and messaging together with a RESTful communication if you want. What is very important, never ever, for instance, if you work with Spring Data REST, never ever, ever, ever put the Spring Data REST URL into the event. Why? An event is immutable. And the Spring Data REST endpoint changes over time. So this needs to point to an event. And I will show you uh, one thing uh, later on, uh, what you need to have in place for this. The next thing is you just send empty events so, so some others can pull on information. Or you can mix the RESTful URL approach with the, uh, with the um, <coughs> approach that puts data into events. This would, I think, my, be my slightly preferred choice for most of the situations. Now. I have a case study on that. So if you are on GitHub and want to check it out, I have an, an implementation event-driven Spring Boot application. And this is an event-driven system based on Spring Boot with Spring Cloud Stream and stuff. And it's about this puck dog having a bank and selling credits. So if you want to check it out, go there. And basically, it's a highly event-driven uh, system. So you have an application process microservices that publishes an event that it generated a new application number. You have a credit application that subscribes to that, works with some internal events, publishes the credit application entered event. You have a customer, a customer created event, and scoring subscribes on both of those, and posts other events, and there's a credit decision that then works on that. That's basically the event flow of this system. Now, in terms of events and Coming to shortly to an end of this talk, there's one more thing that we can look at. And this is a thing that often gets ignored a little bit. I said you can combine REST and events in the payload section. True. But you can also combine it the other way around with HTTP feeds. Now, what is this? Basically, you go ahead, you have an application that offers you an Atom feed via HTTP. You remember the RSS days? RSS is known here? Yeah? Atom is a format for, for such feeds. And you can leverage that and publish events on an HTTP feed. And others can subscribe to your HTTP feed here. The nice thing about that is that you work event-driven, you can work asynchronously because this polling can happen at a predefined rate. So if you have a consistency requirement that a given list needs to be consistent after 30 seconds and you poll on a feed every 15 seconds, you're on the safe side. That's basically eventual consistency. Uh, basically, it's a, a planned kind of consistency that I implement there without you having to maintain a dedicated message broker. Because those rabbits and Kafkas, they are powerful, they are fancy, they are really cool. But ramping up and configuring one of those things in a production-ready manner is a tough task. So the, f the characteristics is you can leverage everything from HTTP in your feeds. Like e-tags, last modified headers, paginations, links, conditional requests. You can do everything. Hey, please give me the events from yesterday 1 a.m. to yesterday 6 p.m. You can do that. You can uh, mitigate a lot of the events from the RESTful direct communication by leveraging feeds. You don't need additional infrastructure, and this is a really cool solution if you're stuck in a hybrid cloud scenario where you have an on-premise cloud and a public cloud because the HTTP ports are usually easy to open on the firewalls. If you go for a proprietary, um, let's say, port number and you want to have that opened on the firewall, you need to do a lot of paperwork usually. HTTP is mostly easy, easy going. But in order to offer events, we have to persist them. And also, when we want to work with RESTful resources in our events on the messaging option, they need to be persistent. And this is where event sourcing comes into play. 
We took those events, stored them in a database, and make them our major persistent model. Now, coming from that, we can use the ideas behind CQRS and derive views, a read model from those events for queries for a higher performance and so on. So this is also quite an interesting thing. But one advice here, please never ever go ahead and build event sourcing applications or CQRS applications. Those are solutions that come into play on dedicated parts of your system. I would never roll that out as a global thing, as a global architectural pattern. They come in handy in certain scenarios. Um, let's wrap it up. First thing, integration is not just technical. Think about organizational communicating aspects between teams. Decouple on your business model. I mean, if you don't decouple it on your business model, you can work with events and messaging and feeds and whatnot as much as you want. You will still be screwed. Um, think about explicit quality criteria. Make that a first-class citizen right next on the same level as your functional requirements. And please consider the technology stuff. Do you want to work with orchestration, with choreography? Which kind of technical options do you want? You don't have to prove, and you shouldn't prove in your microservice application landscapes, that you know all of those options. Limit the options, please. Make wise archi macro architectural decisions. All right. I thank you a lot. I'll be around for, I would say, another half an hour at the conference. After that, I have to hop towards the airport. So if you have any further questions, you can come up to me at any time. You can follow me on Twitter. I will post a link to those slides, I would say, when I'm at the airport. And I assume the Wi-Fi is pretty decent. So I'll post that on my Twitter so you can check out the slides again. And I thank you very much for having me again, Geekon. It was a blast. Thank you.